heart to heart. This is Channel 7 Eyewitness News with Jack Jones, Kim Peterson, Jim Ramsey, Jay Berry, and the Eyewitness News team. Good evening. The federal government may have to lay off hundreds of thousands of employees if President Reagan makes good his threat to veto a major appropriations bill. The House passed it this afternoon, and the Senate passed it tonight, with about $2 billion more than the president wanted to spend. Without the money, the government is broke. And here around Chicago, violence erupts in the wake of a Nazi rally in suburban Berwyn. And in another part of Cook County, residents are getting ready to take court action to stop the dumping of toxic chemicals which they say could endanger their water supply. But our top story tonight comes from Poland, where the leader of the labor movement, Lech Walesa, talked with Jay Levine about Poland's future. We'll have that story as Eyewitness News continues. In Poland, police have broken up a meeting of anti-government dissidents and members of the Solidarity Labor Movement. Government sources say the group was planning to organize a new political party. R.J. Levine was in Poland last week to find out what the situation is there now and to see what effect, if any, the people of Chicago are having on that troubled country. Jay is here tonight with the first of a series of special reports. Jay? Jack, there are about half a million Polish Americans here in the Chicago area, but it is not merely to Poles that the struggle of solidarity has been of vital interest. Many, if not most, Americans identify with their fight for freedom. What we found in Poland, however, is that success on one front can lead to failure on another, and that the country which was already considered one of the most democratic in the world, while we here in the United States were first declaring our independence from England, that country, Poland, is now engaged in a bitter fight for survival. Poland is literally sandwiched between East and West, between communism and capitalism. Only its northern coast on the Baltic Sea is not touched by the Soviet Union or its other satellites, East Germany and Czechoslovakia, with Hungary and Romania close by. Its western influence is provided by West Germany and Austria, which also in many cases serve as sanctuaries for the increasing number of Poles fleeing a system whose economic problems rank among the worst in the world and whose people are paying for them. Poland had become a free state exactly 20 years before Hitler invaded at the start of World War II. Conquest was quick, occupation long and difficult. 40% of Poland's 35 million people either perished or fled, 3 million of them Jews, who died in Hitler's Polish concentration camps. And the Russian liberation in 1944 nearly replaced one form of repression with another. The Russian troops are gone now. These are Polish soldiers at the changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Warsaw's Victory Square. But everyone knows the Russians are not far away, flexing their military muscles, like they did last summer during naval maneuvers in the Baltic off Poland's seaport of Gdansk. So far, the Polish labor movement has ignored them. The farmers revolted in 56, the students in 68, and the workers in Gdansk in 1970 all setting the stage for the formation of the new 10 million member labor union and the emergence of a charismatic young leader in the summer of 1980. It was called Solidarnosc, Solidarity. This is where it all started, at the huge Polish shipyard in Gdansk. 16,000 people work here, and we've come back here to see how the struggle of solidarity has affected them. It was once called the Lenin Shipyard, and while the name was recently changed to that of a Polish nationalist hero, more than half of the ships built here are still sold to the Soviet Union. They range from training ships for the military to huge tankers for U.S.-based merchant fleets. The shipyard is a major force in Poland's battle for economic survival, the country's biggest exporter. But it is also a symbol of the new Poland, where top management, once a tool of Communist Party bosses, is now more closely aligned with Solidarity. Clemens Gniech is its general director. He once worked alongside Solidarity leader Lech Walesa. Now he sits across the bargaining table from him. What is the effect of Solidarity on the operation of this shipyard? Productivity in this shipyard went higher. It went up about 10% last year. Nevertheless, a year of intermittent strikes by shipyard employees, by farmers, by transportation workers, and just about everyone else has cut deeply into the nation's already floundering economy. 
Food and clothing are scarce commodities, and factories are idle, throwing even more people out of work because of a lack of raw materials, component parts, even tools. And the dream, the fantasy of most people here is to come to the country whose streets are paved with gold. Would he like to go there? He says, uh, sure, I would like to go, and I learned that the life is just like in a paradise. Uh, for sure, everybody would like to go, at least to see how it is over there, if it is the same way as the people from there tell the people here, or is it some different way? And when most Poles think of America and its riches, they think of Chicago. Even the man who is undoubtedly the most important leader in the country, Lech Walesa, considers the exchange of ideas and affection, in addition to the desperately needed goods, to be crucial to the struggle of solidarity. Przyłączył Chicago do 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 Polski, albo odwrotnie, Polski do Chicago, ale bez. Of course, if I could, then I would uh, very soon try to uh, uh, join Chicago to Poland, or perhaps Poland to Chicago, the other way around. But but, but of course, in a very peaceful manner, uh, with the consent of, of everybody. Solidarity would not invade Chicago. Solidarność nie będzie przeprowadzona. Za inwazję na Chicago. Nie, 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 nie. No, no. <laughs> Myślę, że tak. So I think uh, there are so many things you could teach us or you could tell us that it's not a question of uh, uh, joining uh, uh, us to you or vice versa, but a question of joining, uh, of, of joining ourselves together, being together. We'll continue our exclusive interview with Lech Walesa later this week, but tomorrow at 6 and 10, we'll first examine the quality of life in Poland viewing the Poles' everyday struggle through the eyes of two young Warsaw residents, one Polish, one American, both of whom having also lived in Chicago. Jack, Kim? That's interesting. Thank you very much, Jay. The Rolling Stones have begun their Chicago tour early and informally. We'll show you where, and Jim Ramsey's also coming up with a word on snow. The president has called an emergency cabinet meeting for tomorrow to oversee the shutdown of non-essential government services and layoffs. It's coming in the wake of a Senate vote tonight approving a $400 billion government funding bill. That was worked out as a compromise yesterday between the House and Senate. But earlier today, as the House was getting ready to vote and officially approve it, President Reagan told reporters it's too costly for him to sign. I just did not feel that I could uh, pass what had finally been decided, which was several billion dollars more than, than we had uh, uh, suggested for the budget. This continuing resolution is a process whereby the Congress can add to the spending and the only choice left to a president is to literally close down the government by, by veto. Essential services will keep running, including social security, air traffic control operations, the post office, and functions related to law enforcement, and of course, national security. Jack. Well, Kim, the stage lights have been dimmed for the last time at one of Chicago's most innovative theaters, the St. Nicholas Theater Company. It's closing its doors because of financial problems. According to a report in Crane Chicago Business, the company lost about $150,000 during the 1979 season and hasn't been able to make up that loss. Ironically, though, St. Nicholas has enjoyed much success in the past few months thanks to a hit show called Herringbone. The St. Nicholas Theater was a creative poem of David Mamet, one of the hottest playwrights in the country. Members of the Nazi party held a rally in Berwyn this afternoon with the blessings of city officials, but as expected, the afternoon ended with violence. And Diane Lawson reports. Members of the National Socialist Party of America were dwarfed by an older front line of defense, the Berwyn Police Department standing out in a face-off with the crowd. And when party leader Michael Allen finally spoke, his words were barely heard. The public address system he'd brought didn't work, and the crowd wasn't listening. As the Nazis left, so did the protesters, 40 members of the Communist People's Party and some black protesters joining in a marching, chanting line. For a while, police went along, keeping order. Then they left. 130 state, county, and local police officers brought in for the rally began boarding buses and leaving surveillance posts on rooftops, saying the job was over. While half a block away, the crowd that had once stood together against the Nazis turned on itself. Berwyn residents began throwing rocks at the visitors, smashing car windows, warning the group never to come back. Where were the police when those people were getting hit with rocks down there? I mean, the police protected... Who did the police protect? Who? We were pulling those men out because it was over. Uh, Allen was out of the city at that point. 
and it was all over as far as we were concerned. We didn't anticipate anything at that location. Would, by 3 o'clock, the residents were walking home, celebrating the afternoon. The curfew on all liquor sales in the city of 60,000 would be lifted soon. There were no arrests, and police say they do not think there were any injuries. In Bruin, Diane Lawson, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. And tonight, homeowners in northwest suburban Cook County are banding together to prevent the dumping of toxic waste materials in their neighborhood. The residents are going to court tomorrow to stop the dumping of sludge containing the chemical PCB in landfill near Des Plaines. The John Sexton Company has already received approval from state and federal authorities to dump a thousand truckloads of sludge dredged from the Chicago River. Tests have shown that the sludge contains PCBs, a chemical that's linked to cancer and birth defects. People living near the dump site are afraid the hazardous chemical will seep into their wa well water and contaminate their water supply. My greatest concern is that the landfill technique that is proposed for the disposal of these wastes is not appropriate and that the hazardous element of these wastes has been far underplayed. We keep talking about PCBs, but we're really concerned about everything else that is in there and, and has not been looked at, at least as far as we can determine. Well, the word with Jim Ramsey's forecast is cold, but we'll show you the hottest place in town when we come back. The Rolling Stones, you know, the rock group, are here in Chicago, and even before their big performance tomorrow at the Rosemont Horizon, the crowds are being stirred up. At the Checkerboard Lounge, a blues club on the south side, Mick Jagger and his Stones are expected to perform for the taping of a TV special. There are dozens of fans out there lined up behind police barricades hoping for a glimpse of the superstars. Even on a chilly night, this had to be the hottest ticket place in town. Still in all, you can freeze yourself out there, couldn't you, Jim Ramsey? <laughs> you sure could, Jack. It's uh, very, very cold. In fact, the entire day has been a lot colder than we expected. Our present temperature is 16 degrees at O'Hare. We'll tell you the rest of the statistics in just a moment. First, let's find out what else is new around the Chicago area today. Highest reading only up to 26 degrees. The overnight low temperature also 16, matching our current reading. Precipitation, none to report today for the month, one in 41 hundredths. Right now, there it is, the chilly news, 16 degrees, humidity 88 percent, barometric pressure is going up a little bit, winds right now are calm. Well, the next big weather maker that we're expecting will enter the Chicago area is right now moving through the Dakotas. This system is going to be producing some rain and snow mixed, probably not beginning in the Chicago area until around noon tomorrow. Don't expect any significant accumulation. In fact, this storm system right now is not producing anything. It's expected, however, to intensify and spread the flakes our way sometime around midday tomorrow. Well, that's, uh, what's wrong with you? Let's take a look here at our satellite picture. Here's a quick glimpse of the cloudiness associated with that storm system. As you can see, it's just now touching central western Illinois. Temperatures across the area. We told you it was a cold night. About the only place that comes close to O'Hare as being a chilly place is Rockford. They're reporting 17 degrees. Now, if your first taste of morning air comes up about 7 o'clock, take a look at this, our 7 a.m. wake-up prediction. Prepare for midday snowflakes, 24 degrees, cloudy skies, tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Tonight, mostly fair and continued cold, low temperature. We've hit it already, 16 to 20, a little warmer downtown. Tomorrow, expect light snow developing, again, probably not before noon, mixed with rain by afternoon, high temperature 32 to 36. Tomorrow night, the snow should be ending early, low temperature 28 to 32, and then for Tuesday, variable cloudiness a little warmer, high temperature 38 to 42. So it may be midweek before we can expect any improvement. Looks like your weather board is frozen over there, doesn't it? Well, something's wrong. <laughs> Thanks. Jay Burry is next with the gruesome story of the Chicago Bears and the Detroit Lions. Jay Berry here to talk about ice. That's right. <laughs> ice. Cold outside, but they were hot at the stadium. More than 17,000 jammed the old building tonight to watch the Blackhawks battle Minnesota for a share of first place. The Hawks fell short of their goal, but didn't lose any ground to the North Stars thanks to Tim Higgins' tying score with 438 left in the 1-1 contest. The standing room only crowd is packed throughout the second balcony, and they watch Dennis Savard skate behind the Minnesota net and shoot. Tim Higgins also shoots. Al Secard jams the puck past Don Beaupre, but the ref 
Hess allows a goal. How do you like that? Minnesota scores in the second period when Craig Hartsburg's shot is rebounded in by Dino Cicerelli. Terry Ruskowski then gets the better of the North Stars, Bill Nyrop, as both battle and tumble to the ice. Doug Wilson's bad pass almost leads to another Minnesota goal, but Tony Esposito makes a brilliant save for the Hawks. Ooh, with about four and a half minutes left, Wilson steals a pass. Higgins scores the goal, and the Hawks wind up with a 1-1 tie. In the rest of the league, Boston lost to Quebec. Philadelphia dropped one to Washington, and the Rangers were beaten by the Islanders. And Eastern Illinois shut out St. Louis for the Midwest soccer title. As for the Bears, they looked so bad this afternoon, they even had trouble getting in and out of the huddle. I can't take credit for that one. Give it to head coach Neil Armstrong. 24 total yards for the Bears offense, the worst output in the history of the team. I could go on and on, but let, let's get this over with as quickly as possible. Here's the score, 23-7 in favor of Detroit. Here's the lowlights. It added up to another rough day for Vince Evans. His troubles start early when he throws right to James Hunter, who returns to the Bears' nine-yard line and sets up a field goal. Nothing seems to work for the Bears. Bob Parsons fakes a punt and tries a fourth down pass, but is tipped and falls incomplete. Detroit Troy takes over and hands to Billy Sims, who is tackled by Al Harris, but Doug Plank is called for a late hit, setting up another field goal. It's 6-0 Detroit. The Bears can't move on offense, but it's not all Evans' fault. He fires one right into Ricky Watt's stomach, but the wide receiver just can't hold on. It was that kind of afternoon. Sims holds on to a pitch out from Eric Hipple, and the running back scampers for 19 yards to the Bears, 39. The Bears' defense holds, but Eddie Murray boots his third field goal. This one from 49 yards out is 9-0 Lions. The defense comes through again after another Evans pass is intercepted. Todd Bell grabs a hippo throw, picks up some blockers, and takes it all the way for a 92-yard touchdown that puts the Bears within just two points of Detroit. It's 9-7 at the half. And the fans finally have something to cheer about. But that's the last Bear highlight. On second and 23, the Bears know Hipple figures to pass, but he still completes a 46-yarder to Freddie Scott. On the next play, Hipple runs it in from the five, and Detroit leads the Bears. The score, 16-7. After Evans is hit hard and given a rest, Bob Avellini tries to pass, but he's buried by the Detroit rush. The Bears troubles on over. Sims passes a 100-yard mark for the day with an outstanding 32-yard effort to the Bears' 17-yard line. Rick Kane shows great effort as he scores the game's final touchdown, and Detroit wins 23-7. Well, the Battle of the Bays in Tampa is one-sided, to say the least. Tampa Bay leads Green Bay 3-0 in the first quarter when reserve Packer quarterback Rich Campbell is intercepted by Cedric Brown. The fifth-year defensive back returns 81 yards to give the Bucks a 10-0 lead, and Cedric shows good form on the spike, a little style and profile. Then Tampa comes up with another big play, this time on offense. James Owens breaks free for 35 yards behind fine blocking, and the Packers trail 17-0. The fans in Florida cheer the Bucks and they cheer some more after punt returner John Holt makes a rookie mistake. He catches a punt instead of letting, letting it bounce into the end zone, but then returns beautifully for 53 yards. Doug Williams makes it 24-0 on a six-yard pass to Cleo Bell and Tampa routes Green Bay 37-3. In Philadelphia, things went the Giants' way today. Joe Donello's 30-yard field goal hits the upright and bounces through. Ron Jaworski fires a six-yard strike to Keith Crefley for a score. But the Giants regained the lead and clinch the win when Terry Jackson picks off a Jaworski pass and returns it 32 yards for a touchdown. New York wins it 20-10. In Cleveland, Terry Bradshaw throws a one-yard TD pass to offensive tackle Ray Penny on the old tackle-eligible play. Then Bradshaw passes for another touchdown to Rick Moser as Pittsburgh routes Cleveland 32-10. In Buffalo, New England leads with five seconds left when Joe Ferguson throws a prayer to Frank Lewis. It's deflected, but Roland Hooks gives the Bills a miracle 2017 win. In Cincinnati, Ken Anderson passes for 396 yards and three touchdowns and 250-pound fullback. Pete Johnson scores twice as the Bengals blast Denver 38-21. In Houston's Astrodome, Ken Stabler is intercepted by New Orleans linebacker Ken Bordelon, who returns it to the Oilers' nine-yard line. Jack Holmes scores a moment later, and the Saints celebrate Bum Phillips' return to Houston with a 27-24 win. 
Well, Miami fell to the Jets on a last-second touchdown pass from Richard Todd to Jerome Barkham that moves the Jets into a tie for first place with the Dolphins. Kansas City routed Seattle. Baltimore fell to St. Louis. Dan Faust tossed six scoring passes, four to Kellen Winslow as San Diego beat Oakland. A Ray Worshing field goal as time ran out guided San Francisco over Los Angeles, and Dallas moved into a tie with Philadelphia with a win over Washington. The Catholic League championship game is scoreless in the third quarter when St. Rita quarterback Joe, Joe Kelly is intercepted deep in his territory by R Rich Moser of Mount Carmel. St. Rita holds at the five, but Mount Carmel recovers a uh, fumble. Andre Dawson takes advantage by racing to his right and scoring for Mount Carmel, and the caravan leads 7-0. Collins isn't through. The 5'8 junior picks up 10 yards for Mount Carmel to the Mustangs' 9-yard line late in the game. Quarterback and co-captain Jim Sherlock rolls to his left and scores, and Mount Carmel blanks St. Rita to win the championship 14-0. Well, here's another one for the scoreboard. In Canada's Grey Cup, Ottawa fell short of upsetting Edmonton, losing 26 to 23. And I understand that's all I have. I got to give it back to you. You mean there's even Thank more? You. Yes. What a <laughs> low. <laughs> Let me see. So I'll read it later. <laughs> there's more coming up. Stay with us. Be right back. These are some of the stories we'll be watching for you tomorrow. The government is braced for President Reagan's veto of a bill to keep the government in business. Here in Chicago, the medical examiner has scheduled an autopsy on the body of Russell Goldman, the man who was found hanged in a police lockup on Saturday. A federal judge is expected to hand down a ruling in a court case on the state's new congressional districts. It could shape the political future of Illinois for the next decade. And Adlai Stevenson will be in Chicago tomorrow, campaigning to be the next governor. And that is our late report. ABC's Weekend Report is next. I'm Jack Jones. And I'm Kim Peterson. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Good night. Sally Field, Joanne Woodward. In a story you won't want to remember, but you'll never forget. Sybil. Begins tomorrow at 3. Eyewitness News has been a presentation of WLS-TV Chicago.